Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we will be doing the second novel in the Babyverse series by Dennis E. Taylor and it is called For We Are Many published in 2017. You could do me a favor by subscribing, giving us a like and dropping us a comment and now let's get into it. Bob was watching the Deltons with a drone and he finally got a medicine woman to try something new to clean the wound of a warrior with hot water. And Bob is spending time with Archimedes trying to help him improve. One of the big questions is why the Deltons left that area in the first place since it seemed to be a much better area than where they ended up. After a couple of years of research, Bob and Marvin came to the conclusion that there was another apex predator out there bigger than the gorilloids that were helping to drive the deltans into extinction and they set about trying to find out what it was. When the deltan mating season came around, Archimedes not being the strongest deltan was losing a lot of the matches so Bob decided to show him a few jiu-jitsu moves. That helped him up his game. Meanwhile, Bob and Marvin found evidence that whatever it was that were hunting the Deltons was only about a mile away because they found old chewed on Delton bones. So now they are in a hunt to find them before they find the Deltons. When Mulder came into the system, he found five planets in orbit around the A star and a scan told him that there were two planets in the habitable zone and one of which had oxygen and water. There wasn't any gas giants or asteroid belts in the system. He got into orbit around the third planet and it had oxygen but no land. It was a total ocean planet. When he surveyed the rest of the system, he saw that the second moon of the fourth planet had good ore deposits close to the surface, so that's where he set up his auto factory and began mining the moon's surface. Once he got the EMI up and running, he had it build a couple of bobs. And while that was going on, he went back and took a look at the third planet and he saw that it had plants that were sitting on top of the water and these plants formed huge mats and they were hundreds of kilometers in diameter. And the plants and what animals they were seemed to be biocompatible with humans. By this time the bobs were completed and they took the names Skinner and Johnny. He named the planet Poseidon. Vehement was escalating their terrorist acts. They've now taken to killing livestock in their attempt to ensure that the human species go extinct. They would now have to find the calories that those livestock represented and replace them, which they should be able to because Homer was keeping a little in reserve just in case it was needed. Mulder has just finished the Subspace Communications Universal Transceiver or SCUT as it is called. It allows instantaneous communications within a 25 light year radius. When he turned it on, it had four stations, Sol, Epsilon, Iridani, Alpha Centauri, and Omnicron 2 Iridani. When he connected and selected Epsilon Iridani, Bill immediately popped into his VR. They updated each other, including the fact that he found a colonization planet. It was not ideal because it was an ocean world, but right now they couldn't afford to be picky. After they were finished and they had disconnected, he got prepared to do some more work because he needed to prepare information about some of the creatures in that ocean, especially the one he called the Kraken. On Earth, the climate is worsening, the glaciers are spreading, and the amount of food that Earth can supply is falling. And you have Vehement who is doing their very best to end the human species once and for all. But on the good side, colony ships 4 and 5 are almost completed, and they have two new systems to send people to. Omnicron 2 Eridani and Eta Cassiopeia. And the argument that the UN is having is if they should send both ships to one of those two systems or split the ships up and send them to one system each. Bill received the first Scott connection from Bob in Delta Eridani. Bob updated him on finding the first intelligent species beside humans, the Deltans. 
and Bill updated Bob telling him what has happened in the solar system, how many humans are left, and that there were at least 20 Bobs running around in various systems. He's also working to perfect the android so that Bobs will be able to transfer themselves into an android and feel what humans feel. Bob and Marvin were using Explorer drones to try and find the apex predator that had driven the Deltons from their original home. Then they lost one of their drones. It seemed to have been attacked from above. When they found the wreckage of the drone, it was bitten in half and had claw marks. It would seem that the Deltons left that area because something that was bigger and meaner than the Gorilloids was attacking them. And they figured that the Gorilloids were the lesser of two evils. Meanwhile, Archimedes and his maid Diana had a son, and Bob loved to spend time monitoring the family. He was also in the process of creating four new Bobs. Then he got notified of another attack, and this time it was flying, and it snatched away one of the Deltons. And as far as the Deltons could tell, it was invisible, because although they were looking right at it, they couldn't see it. Once he told the Deltons about it, half the Deltons was mad at him for bringing them back there. Then Marvin figured out what these creatures were. It seems that when they first got to this planet, they noticed a small creature the size of a robin that could blend in with its, blend in with its environment almost perfectly. Well, these new creatures are a bigger version of those, and they had named them Hippographs. They located their roost on an island about two kilometers off the coast. The next time one was headed for the Delton village, Bob and Marvin were able to kill it. The next time, 14 hippogriffs headed for the village. Their drones managed to kill most of them, while the Deltons killed two that had landed. A lot of the Deltons were upset with Bob because they felt he led them to a place where flying, invisible monsters could eat them. So Bob got the idea what to do. He dropped a steel ball on the island, totally obliterating the island and the hippogriffs. Shock waves and debris fell all around, but because he had warned them, no Deltons were hurt. That's when the Deltons got together and decided they wanted to be by themselves and he should leave them to their fate and he should go away. There was an attack in a favela in Brazil. 63 people were dead. These were people that had nothing. All they had was a hope that they would immigrate to a new planet before Earth was no longer habitable. When Riker turned back to the UN meeting, Minister Gerald was once more attacking the replicants and he was shouted down by the rest of the UN because now that the two ships Exodus 4 and 5 was due to launch this month, the UN wanted to nail down who was going to be on what ship and who was going to get the evacuated territories. Riker noticed that Homer didn't make an appearance he normally did at these UN meetings. It was over a year before Bob found Archimedes alone and in a camouflage drone spoke with him. He let Archimedes know that he is still protecting the Deltons, that he's killed six hippogriffs so far. He, all he did was destroy a local nest. Archimedes was surprised to know that he was still protecting them. That's when Marvin told Bob that he was leaving now that things have settled down in this system. So Marvin headed off to P3 Orionis. He kept in touch via a Scott connection. Updating Marvin, Bob told him that the newest Bobs, Pete and Victor, were ready to leave. Victor was willing to follow the trail of either Luke or Bender since no one has heard from them since they left. Pete, on the other hand, was going to go off in his own direction. Bob and Marvin were both worried that something bad may have happened to both Luke and Bender. Vehement blew up a supply delivery to Vancouver Island and most troubling of all they were able to sabotage one of the donuts, the food space stations. Something they should not have been able to do. So now Riker is going over every piece of communication to see how exactly they did it. Then Vehement was able to destroy one of the donuts. And about the same time there were several terrorist attacks on Florianopolis. Both attacks seemed to be coordinated, but Riker was having trouble figuring out how. And he was also worried about Homer, who didn't seem to be acting normally. Not getting anywhere, Riker tried to bait vehement by insulting them during a UN meeting. And while monitoring all of the traffic and communications, he detected a tight beam signal going from New Zealand to Homer's ship. 
That's when he realized that Homer's odd behavior meant that it probably wasn't Homer anymore. He and Charles got together about 50 meters apart and communicated via laser link to ensure that it was interception free. They came up with a plan and they got Homer to meet with them. And when they were sure it was Homer, they disabled him by sending a steel ball through his reactor control system that shut Homer down. When they examined Homer, they found that the infection came in through laser calms, a hole in their defenses that they did not even consider. Charles and Riker checked each other to make sure they were clean. Then they went over Homer, cleaning out the virus that had infected him. When they finally got Homer back in one piece, he was very upset. He was trapped. He couldn't do anything. They had total control of him. They made him lie. They made him blow things up. They made him kill people. Meanwhile, Riker had Guppy trace that tight beam signal to where it originated in the back country of New Zealand. And then he set about tracing the mastermind. Charles came into Riker's VR and he said Homer's gone. He overloaded his reactor and blew himself up. And he deleted all of his backups. He left a message for them that said, Guys, I'm sorry to do this to you. I know how it'll go over, but I can't live with what was done to me and what I have done. I have flashbacks constantly. I can't forget the feeling of being controlled. It was like being able to feel a tapeworm moving around inside you and there's nothing you can do. He ended the message by saying, please find the people who are responsible and drop something on them. He promised to grant Homer his last wish. Mario finally got into the system seven years after leaving Beta Hydri. That was three years ship time. When he examined the system, he found that it was stripped of metal just like Beta Hydri. The others had gotten here first. He went and took a look at the planet in the habitable zone. Examining the planet with drones, he saw massive destruction. Entire cities were taken apart. His observations showed that the destruction was total, the devastation was worldwide, and the others, whoever they were, collected the dead bodies. He could think of only one reason to collect dead bodies. He knew that when they met the others, it would be war. It's been six years since Bob was kicked out of the village and he's been speaking to Archimedes on the sly. TPs have been introduced along with bows and arrows. When he got a Scott communication from Luke. Luke was in a Kappa Seti system. There was a habitable planet in that system but it was a super earth with a gravity over 3G. Humans couldn't live there but there was life on it. And no one has heard from Bender. Rekha found a man who was the mastermind of Vehement. He was in a little isolated farmhouse and Riker watched him at his monitors and listening on his conversations. He was using passive detection so the man didn't know he was being watched and listened to. But Riker wanted to confront him before he took him out. The man's name was Mr. Vickers and he was the one that was fermenting the attacks in Brazil and vehement. And he did it all from a little red farmhouse in New Zealand. When he was finished speaking with him, Riker dropped two busters, one on the farmhouse and one on Vehement's headquarters. He then confronted Minister Gerald at the UN who was working for Mr. Vickers. He then threatened Minister Gerald by saying if he said another word, he would bring him upstairs and push him out of airlock. Bill had received two messages from Linus who was on his way back to Epsilon Iridani. The first told him all about Henry Roberts, the replicant from Australia. And the second that arrived a few days before he got there was a status update. In Absalon Indy, where he was, there was a gas giant that had a moon that was habitable. Both the planet's orbit and its axis was inclined at a 90 degree angle. When Linus finally got there, he introduced Henry Roberts to Bill, who had begun building them next generation ships and began bringing them up to date on the Bobbyverse. Buster Archimedes' son had taken a mate, and tents covered most of downtown Camelot, the name that Bob gave the village. In the past two years, there have been violence between the Deltons. As he and Marvin watched the Delton village in VR, they decided that the violence must be a consequence of the Delton population that is growing. Mario found what he was looking for in this system metal. The first thing he did was to build a space station and then when it was complete he sent every bit of information he had gathered about the others to Bill. The next thing he did was to build four more barbs. 
and they promptly named themselves bashful, dopey, sleepy, and hungry. They decided they would have to find these aliens that they called the others. To do that, they would each go to a separate system and they would keep a transmission channel open at all times. So they picked their destination systems and headed out. Mario was still in the system when he received Bill's Scott plans. He built himself one right away and then connected to the network. The systems on the network were Tar City, Omnicron 2 Eridani, Sol, Epsilon Eridani, Epsilon Indy, Alpha Centauri, Delta Eridani, Pi 3 Orianis, Eta Cassiopeia A, and Kappa Seti. He pinged Bill and connected with him and updated him on the others. Bill sent him all the plans he had and he promised to begin working on weapons. When they were finished speaking, Mario began to build another cohort of barbs. This time he was going to make sure that they had FTL communications built in and he was going to upgrade them to version 3 ships. Bob got an alert and it seems that Deltons were fighting Deltons in the village. Archimedes and Buster and their wives Diana and Belinda were not participating but they were standing ready with weapons to defend themselves. After the fighting was over, about 17 people were dead. Bob and Marvin believed that it was the overcrowding that was causing the violence. So he visited Archimedes, his drone looking like a rock, and told him his theory, including the concept of reverse psychology in order to get some people in the village to move to a new village. The plan worked, and about a hundred young Deltons went off to start a village of their own. Of course, Archimedes had brought the plan to the council as if it was his idea, but Arnold figured out that Bob had a hand in it. Of course, he wasn't going to say anything because he liked Bob. Of course, both Marvin and Bob was happy that the plan worked, but Marvin was afraid that in a few years, both villages may go to war with each other. Archimedes' family had grown, three children and a fourth on the way, and the Delton population had also grown to up over 1,100. The council never relented in their banishment. But Bob continued to help the Deltons and to watch over Archimedes and his family. Bill tested out an android moose on the surface of Ragnarok. He wasn't quite ready to try a bipedal humanoid android yet. And the terraforming of Ragnarok was slowly coming along. He had created 10 new Bobs and they were going to try and take 82 Eridani. They think they killed all the Medeos in the system, but he had left automated weapons and they needed to take that system back because it had two habitable planets. Once the 82 Eridani expedition had left, he introduced Henry Roberts and Linus to the other Bobs. Bill had perfected an asteroid mover that used individual surge drives that were placed around the asteroid without touching it. All of the drives generated a field that enclosed the entire asteroid. This particular asteroid was made of ice and when it got into the atmosphere of Ragnarok, they would blow it up and it would fall as rain over the next few weeks. As Bashful approached the system, he detected radio traffic. He was traveling at 5% the speed of light and he launched his two stealth probes to free fall through the system. It would take the probes about two weeks to go through the system and he was going to go around the system and wait for them on the other side. He got to the other side several days ahead of them. When they were close to him, they sent him their data. The system had three planets, two inner rocky planets and a small gas giant further up. The data showed that there was something in orbit around the sun within the orbit of the inner planet that was not a planet or a satellite. And that was where the radio signals were coming from. He was in an empty area of the system a good 6 billion kilometers away from the sun and he was surprised when his proximity alarms started going off. There was six ships coming at him. Five of them looked like the wrecked cargo ship they found on the dead planet. And the sixth one looked like a smaller version of the Death Star. But instead of an inset dish like the Death Star, it had a flat section that looked like a grid. And just as he thought he was going to get away, that sixth ship turned its grid towards him. Then the grid started to glow. That's when the guppy suddenly reported, alert, 
controller replicant offline, search drive offline, requirements for self-destruct protocol have been met, reactor overload engaged. Hal was 10 months away from Jalice 877 when he got Bashful's final radio transmission. He changed his angle of approach so they wouldn't be able to trace him back to Jalice 54. He made sure to update Mario on everything via Scott. When he got close to Jalice 877, he fired off probes with orders to wait at a spot two light hours away from where he would be waiting. Then he watched to see what happened. He was planning to wait a week, but he only had to wait two days before a flotilla of others showed up to the probe's positions. At that point, he had the probe self-destruct and he headed away from Jalice 877. He was planning to loop around and come at it from a different angle. When he went over the data he got from the probes, he realized that the second outer planet was completely encased in metal and that the object that they were detecting around the sun was the beginnings of a Dyson sphere. The inner planet's atmosphere was very polluted and its temperature was almost too hot for humans. That's when he got a proximity alert. He of course tried to get away traveling at his maximum speed of 10 G's, but they were faster. They were going at 12.5 G's. He managed to shake them and sent off his observations and data to Mario but he wanted to know how they detected him, so he was going to try a theory. Again, this time he was detected and zapped, and the last thing was Guppy saying, alert, controller replicant offline, surge drive offline, requirements for self-destruct protocol have been met, reactor overload engaged. Bill was having a barb moot. There were 43 barbs in attendance. Some of them were up to 30 light years away. At the meeting, they discussed that the weapon that the others are using seemed to be some sort of gamma ray emitter. That was what was used to destroy the dead civilizations that was found, but also the barbs. They was going to develop a shield that they thought would work against the zapper and they sent it off to Mario. And Hal, who was revived from his backup, had volunteered to test it. The big question that came out in meeting was could they win that war? The others had faster ships and better surge drives and could send power through their shutter. But because they're building that Dyson sphere, they would probably need all the metal in every system within 30 to 40 light years. That includes the Deltans, Earth, and the colonists. The colony ships. Exodus 1 and 2 were orbiting Vulcan. Most of the colonists from the USC were still in stasis. Just a few, like construction teams, security teams, and engineers, had been brought out to clear enough jungle to build homes. And Exodus 3 was just a few months away. On Vulcan, a few of the large predators had attacked, but the only casualties was equipment. He spoke and made a few security plans with Colonel Butterworth, the large predators that they call raptors because they kind of look like them killed two colonists. But Colonel Butterworth thinks they have the situation and security well in hand. And the town that they call Landing is completed. So he gave the order to take the colonists out of stasis. And Bird and Ernie began waking the colonists and shuttling them down to their new homes on Vulcan. Bill hosted a Scott baseball game. Then they broke into groups and went to the virtual pub and began discussing things. In one of these discussions, Bill related that his asteroid mover could probably right now move something about half the size of Ceres. And theoretically, there's no limit to how big a mass he will be able to move. It's just an engineering problem. And while Bill was working on his android Bullwinkle, Garfield was making an adaptation to it that flew. It worked for a few minutes before it crashed. He named it Rocky. And now he's going to start working on Rocky too. And it came up that the barbs may be the start of a new species called Homo sideria. Farm 1 and Farm 2 was in full operation producing kudzu. And he had just spun up Farm 3 which would produce regular crops, vegetables, wheat, berries. The colony ship Exodus 3 had just arrived. Once the leader of the third ship was offloaded, all three groups immediately began to argue. Faith, USE, and Spitzbergen all began to argue over who got to do what. 
He then began to discuss with Colonel Butterworth how things are going and the Colonel told him that there is a native vine that's turning into a significant problem. And he's hoping that when they have some livestock, that some of the livestock will like to eat it. Well, that's the end of part one. Part two will be in an upcoming video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.